know that all of this disrupts everybody's life. There's no question about that. But until we have a vaccine, a treatment, or a cure, the vaccine is also causing a lot of disruption in your students' lives and in your staff's lives. And there are many of those who are going to be coming back to school that have lost a family member because of COVID-19. So what we are trying to do is we want to make sure that you have the tools so you can educate, adapt to these things, be patient. This is not going to go on for our lifetime until this pandemic runs its course and tolerance. Um, people get a little testy. Uh, you probably noticed that. Uh, I should add to this uh, a sense of grace because I think that's what we all need to give each other uh, when we're having that testy day. So the local health departments in your community are available to help you with questions that you might have. We're hoping each school will have a, a COVID-19 kind of contact person. That's what they have in the Healthy at Work program. We want a Healthy at School program to have that kind of, of uh, connection. So you've got one person that can kind of spearhead all of this. They don't have to be a medical person. In fact, the school nurse is probably busy enough as it is. So um, uh, we want that contact person that our local health department can work with if and when there's going to need to be contact tracing. It would be real unusual, I would think, for a school system to go all year without at least having one case of COVID-19. That's the public health aspect of, of the five buckets that we want to look at. I wanted to share with you just some current data, just so you know where Kentucky is in connection to other states. This is a website called 91 Divoc, which is COVID-19 spelled backwards. And I did not put that website on this slide. I am so sorry. So it's COVID-19 spelled backwards, 91 Divoc. And this is showing you over time, and I believe you can see my pointer. So this is when the infection started. And this is New York. And you remember seeing those horrible pictures of New York. But look what's happened in New York City over time. You can see that that's gone down dramatically. Will it stay down? I don't know, because if you look here and then you look up here, you can see that this is Florida, this is Texas, this is California, this is Georgia, this is Arizona right here. So these are states that had some cases of COVID at the very beginning, but they have had an upsurge. Well, what do we look at when we look at Kentucky? This is that same slide. So here's New York right here and the other states, of Florida, Texas, and California. Here's Kentucky that right down here. If you look at it uh, on, a, a law, uh, on, on a linear scale, this is where Kentucky fits in to these other states. This is another way of looking at it. This is logarithmically. You can see things a little bit better and you can see where, this, uh, I'm sorry, this is Washington State. I didn't even pay attention to my own notes. Uh, this is Washington State. Well, why am I showing you Washington State? If you remember, I said Seattle, Washington was the first place where on the United States, uh, con continental United States, um, we saw COVID-19. Look at what happened with Washington State they started leveling off here pretty soon within 45, 35 days. Look what happened. This is New York here. This is New Jersey here. Why did Washington State drop like they did and not have the kind of surge that the other initial states on the East Coast had? If you remember, Washington State just experienced a very large measles outbreak. You may not even remember it, but in the public health world, it was huge news. Uh, we shouldn't be having measles outbreaks in the United States. The people in Washington, the public health community, and the general public were introduced to those five buckets I talked about, social distancing, mask wearing, um, high hand hygiene, temperature and screening, and uh, contact tracing. So once they got a handle on what was going on in Washington State, they put those uh, those different buckets into action. And you can see how after a couple of months, they, are be, they still have cases. It's not, it's not a cure-all for everyone if, if everyone doesn't follow the rules, but they have been able to manage this much better than other states have. So here is, is Kentucky. So we are kind of in the middle of the pack and we had the increase like everyone else had 
but you're seeing it, by looking at this particular map, it doesn't look, or this graph, it doesn't look like we're having a big increase. However, if you look at this, and this, I'm sorry, this is just a little bit of bigger close up so you can see what states are, are having fewer uh, outbreaks in Kentucky. I'd be very worried if I was Idaho. Look at this increase they've had over the last month or so, also in Montana. But here is Kentucky, if you look at um, the, the number of cases just kind of expanded so you can see it better. Look how we were on a line that you would expect we should be right about here. But look what has happened within the last three weeks, how our numbers have gone up. This is looking at deaths, and again, you're seeing uh, an increased number of deaths, but you're seeing a, a more of a flattening on that right now in Kentucky. Uh, this is looking again at, at looking at it linearly, and you're seeing, if you can kind of do that epidemiology thing and squint, you're seeing that we are pretty close, although these last few points are a little higher than you would have expected to see if you just were expecting that same linear increase. So we are not the highest state in the nation, uh, but the turn that we're taking is, is extremely worrisome uh, for us here in the Department of Public Health. If you have not gone to our website, I've got the website uh, it, at the end of the presentation, so you can have that. And these slides will be made available for anybody that's interested in having them. I just took a snapshot this morning of, our, of the website and what it looks like. And it is updated about five o'clock every day. So these are the total number of cases we've had as of five o'clock yesterday. This gives you a bar graph by, a, by age group of the cases. And you're gonna see that the highest number of, a, of cases we have is in a much younger. You've got 80, 70, 60, 50, 40s, 30s. The 20 to 29 year old age group has our highest number of cases. These are cases. Flip that down here with deaths by age group and look at the difference. You've got 75% of our deaths in the 70 and over. And I think that's the message most people heard. They didn't hear this over here that the cases are higher in the younger people who are either out working or they're out doing what young people do, interacting with other young people and we're seeing so many more cases in the age group. This pie chart over here uh, can be broken down by race. You can also look at ethnicity and you can look at sex, male versus female. The death, you have the same pie chart. You can look at, this is at looking at race, you can look at ethnicity and you can look at sex. This map right here, if you click on any of these counties, it will show you the number of cases, the number of deaths. Uh, you can go over here and you can look up the county if you want to, and it's listed by the, the counties with the most number of cases. And this is our epi curve. And what this is telling you is date that a specimen was collected, and we had our peak, and then we had our lull, and now we're seeing our peak again. This map is just uh, the same as the other map. Well, I'm making everybody seasick. This is, this is looking at number of cases, and this next map is looking at the rate by the population. Uh, and the darker, of course, the color, the, the higher that rate is. This is what I was talking about when I was talking about if we did no mitigation at all, if we hadn't worn masks, if we hadn't done social distancing, if we hadn't done healthy at home. Uh, this was a, a project that was done at the University of Kentucky where they showed what they would expect to see uh, in cases in Kentucky by logarithmic or by a linear scale, just by counting cases, what they expected to see cases-wise. This only goes through March the 24th. They were expecting by March the 24th for us to be in the 45,000 cases. And by March the 24th, we were only, uh, and my eyes aren't that good, but I'm pretty sure that's 5,000 cases. So that shows what Kentuckians have done to help make this, these numbers not be what we were afraid they might could be. I did this presentation a week ago or a similar presentation. I was pulling some slides and this shows a, a, a website called COVID Exit Strategy. And they were looking at states by whether they were the, uh, a dark red, uncontrolled spread, a, a regular red, a poor, trending poorly, yellow, uh, making uh, progress, and then green trending better. 
And so I pulled this up last night, uh, this morning, and I was going to update the slide, but I wanted you to see, this is July the 12th, and this is this morning. I'm gonna go back. Look at the number of yellow and regular red states in this map, and now look how they've almost all disappeared as we are trending poorly. So this is a website that you can play around with. You can scroll over different states. You can look at a whole host of different factors as to why they call these states um, bruised red, red, yellow, or green. This is another website that I particularly thought was quite interesting. It's done by Harvard University. And what they've done is they have given you a green, yellow, orange, and red for every county in the state of, uh, of the United States. And there's the website, globalepidemics.org, and I got this off this morning. Look how the counties south of us have so many red counties. Over here, you can go and click on the state. At first, it gives you by, uh, by state the highest rate per 100,000 people over the last seven days. And then you can click on a state and it'll give you that state's information. These are what their red, green, yellow, and orange stand for. And I just picked out Franklin County, because that's where I live, and it told me that new cases for 100,000 people over the last seven days was 6.4. We're in the yellow county, we've had 186 cases, and we've had five deaths. Oh, doesn't have it. I thought I did another slide uh, where I actually clicked on Kentucky so you could see how you could click there and it would take you to every single county so you don't have to take your cursor and actually go over it to find that, but or you can do it either way. Look at Maine. Maine is either they're not testing well and they don't know uh, their numbers of cases or they're doing particularly well. There are counties that are, are doing well. So for the interest of this group, I know many of you have already started working. You've already started seeing patients. You've used this guide. So again, I apologize for those that know what this is. This is, um, we're calling this the Healthy at School document. Uh, this has involved all those conversations I told you about that I'd have with the superintendents and, and different task force and advisory boards. Uh, also, I have worked with the school nurse uh, team here in our Department of Public Health and also with school nurse team at the Department of Education. And what we decided would be the best advantage for schools in the state of Kentucky would be for us to come up with what we're calling safety expectations. Safety expectations, and it'll be a little bit later, you'll see this, but safety expectations are the things we, would, we want schools to do. And then best practices are other things that we know other schools are doing. And if a school has the bandwidth to do this, this might be something they might want to consider. This is going to look very familiar to you because uh, you know all about social distancing and face cloth. We did throw in protective equipment to help staff understand using that. But these are the, the five buckets plus PPE that we've been talking about for the last 40 minutes. Um, that's the table of contents of this document if you haven't looked at it. And how to use this. Uh, we wanted schools to feel like uh, there isn't, that we at the Department for Public Health cannot tell schools how to run. Um, it's not our expertise, but knowing safety uh, expectations is. So with working with the school system, we came up with basic safety expectations in these areas listed, and then we added the best practices that some schools might want to add. And this is just a picture. There's a section on social distancing, and then and kudos to Kentucky Stats. I told Lieutenant Governor that uh, I want to take every public health document we ever do and give this to them because this was a 14 page type document that we kind of did some bullet points and did some underlining and changed fonts and we thought we were being really exotic. And then we sent it to them and ended up with this beautiful document that also has an at a glance uh, at, at the end of each section. This is poster kind of material. Uh, so you can show people what social distancing actually looks like. Uh, I really like this one because it shows you not, how not to wear a mask. Uh, I, except for this one, I've seen the other two in many public spaces that I've been in, although not as much recently, but when people were first, were first wearing them, I heard one person in a, um, in a public venue tell another person that wearing a mask over your Adam's apple is not helpful. 
uh, and it's not. So remember the nose and the mouth and those, those respiratory droplets, that's what the mask is going to be covering. This is going to be very difficult for children, just as it is for adults to learn this, but we can learn this. Uh, will it happen every single second of every single school day? No, uh, but mitigation is what we're looking for, risk reduction. If we want to make sure that no one else in Kentucky gets COVID-19, everyone should stay home in a bubble, and that is not possible. We have to get out, we have to get food, we have to do medical care, we have to, many of us work because of, uh, to, to keep your family alive. There are essential services that people never thought of grocery store shop, stockers as essential services, or many people didn't. Truckers, postal workers, uh, obviously teachers and uh, people that work in the healthcare community. There are so many essential workers out there and that's why this is so critically important for us to be sure we protect them and we protect each other. So yeah. we're getting better with masks. We're learning our masks and we're learning how to use them. We're learning social distancing. We're learning all of these things. And the very last part of this document, this Healthy at Schools, is contact tracing. And as I mentioned before, contact tracing is not your job as a teacher. Your job as a teacher is to be able to pay attention to keep track of what happens in your, in, in your area, in your space when you're teaching. It may also involve contact tracing has to do with you. Were you in the front of a classroom but you were six feet away from your students and you wore a mask and they wore a mask then, and you were only in one classroom period with them? Well then, depending on the contact tracer talking to you will determine whether or not you're a low risk person that needs to continue maintaining your, uh, your PPE and your social distancing or was that particular uh, child someone that you spent a great deal of time with, you were very close to them, there were times when the child didn't wear the mask, all sorts of different factors. People keep telling me, tell me exactly how this contact tracing works and my answer is it's variable. It depends on the situation, the length of time, whether masks were worn or not, whether that, that uh, student or that other faculty member were symptomatic. All of those things are involved in that contact tracing. But the more we can help the contact tracers, the less likely that there'll be a school closure. And if those students and that, those staff can be removed from the school setting, then that will keep from disrupting the rest of the students in that classroom's educational experience. So that's the message I want to share. I see we've got 21 chats, and I'm sorry I can't see the chats while I'm talking. So I do want to give you this website, uh, which is the kycovid19.ky.gov. That's where you can see um, all of the Healthy at Work documents. You can see contact tracing information. There's a Q&A about masks. Uh, there's uh, the dashboard that I showed you. There's a map of all the different testing sites that we're aware of in the state of Kentucky that you can go to. And if you click on that, it'll tell you the phone number, the time that this uh, particular clinic is open, the days that it's open and information that you need about that. There's a lot of links to CDC and other national uh, sites. We didn't see any need in us writing something up that's just mimicking the CDC, let's link you right to them or whatever uh, national organization uh, speaks with authority on different topics. Uh, but that is our way of trying to be sure the public has at their access information that they need. I also listed my information uh, because I am certainly not the expert on everything, but I know an awful lot of people in state government, the size of the Department of Public Health, and I can usually direct you to who you might need uh, to, to learn about a particular topic. But I would start first in your own school system because there is very likely someone in that system that's been in a meeting, that's, that's already asked this question, that can share with you. Uh, we are going to be part, I'm gonna be part of a webinar on Thursday afternoon that the Department of Education is having for teachers. So um, I, if you don't have that contact information or that uh, meeting information, I'm, I'm happy to share that with anyone that is interested in that.
So this is going to leave us about 18 minutes of time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing now. So I hope you've gotten that information. And again, I will we'll send these slides out. But I'm going to go to the chat box. And Ronnie, is this what I'm supposed to do now? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I went through and wrote down the, the questions that were not okay. answered. If you want me to go ahead and, and give you those. Um, I think okay. we have three questions that were asked that were not uh, responded to by other folks in the room um, at the time. Okay. So, uh, I think one of the questions that folks have is about uh, when we talked about wiping down seats, you talked about wiping down desks, those kind of things. Uh, a question about uh, the virus living on paper because we hand out papers in classroom, we collect papers, uh, we send homework home with kids, we send work back to their cottages if they're in a group home or to their pods if they're in a DJJ facility. Uh, what kind of guidance can you give us about um, how that, does it live on those papers? Is that, how do we handle those kinds of situations? That's a really good question. Um, and if we're, if we're all masked, then those papers should not have a significant amount uh, on them. Uh, but yes, it does live on paper documents, but not to the, to the extent that, uh, again, back in March, we were very afraid of and people were, you know, wiping down their groceries and wiping down their mail. I've got a friend who this day, Amazon comes and delivers and they set it out on the front porch and leave it out in the sun for 48 hours before they open it. Um, I don't think we need to be as concerned if we're using the hand sanitizer. Uh, I don't, uh, gloves is something people want to wear all the time, but if you put on a pair of gloves and you wear them for a significant period of time, you're just spreading things. So you'd be much better off if when kids, uh, when your students turn in your papers and you collect all those papers and you put them on your desk, then I do a squirt of hand sanitizer. When you, after you finish handling them, again, do a squirt of hand sanitizer. If you're using your hand sanitizer and you're not putting your hands in your nose and your mouth, it's not going to jump off the paper on you. There's going to have to be some kind of transfer from that paper to your body. So I don't think we need to be quite as afraid if we're being conscious about, yes, there could be something on this, and yes, I'm going to do the right things to protect myself. Um, so I, I, that would be the way I would approach it uh, in that situation. It's the way I approach it here. People bring things into me all the time that need to be re read and reviewed, but the hand sanitizer, and, and being especially careful about touching my face is, is a big deal. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question someone had was about um, if someone was diagnosed with COVID-19, um, but they obviously, you know, the survival rate is, is uh, fairly good for those who are in the younger age demographics. Uh, what kind of lingering symptoms might a person have after they have tested positive but recovered? Well, that is a, that's a great question, and we don't know because this virus has only existed for March, April, May, June, July, five months. We're into the fifth month. So long-term results, we don't know. Now, I, I have seen some, art. I, I assume there would be respiratory issues because these people seem to have some pretty significant respiratory issues, but they also have multi-organ failure. And what that means is they get sick respiratory-wise, but then that virus gets into their, their system through their bloodstream and they get a form of sepsis. And one of the things that kills a lot of these folks is renal failure, uh, kidney failure. You've probably heard about people in the hospital, famous people that are getting dialysis. That's because the, the virus has overwhelmed their system and they actually have kidney failure and need to have that turned around until their body fights the virus off and they recover. What kind of renal function are these people going to have down the road is one that I'm particularly worried about. Um, but we have all we have is five months worth of, of data right now, looking at those people that were sick back in March. And, and that's one that people are looking at. We don't know if statistically it's that big, but we do know it does affect some people. So that, that's a, that's a non-answer. How is that? It, well, it's the best answer we have right now. I think that's, that's really well, important. And as a physician, it is very hard for me to say, I don't know, because I feel like when I'm seeing patients, I should know the answers to their questions. 
I'm getting better at I don't know because there's so much we don't know. And in saying that unapologetically, but saying we're we're reading, we're looking, and when we know something new, we're ready to share with people. Great, thank you. I think one of the uh, interesting things about um, in particular programs that serve children and youth who are in the care or custody of the Commonwealth, uh, KECSAC programs that, that I work with in particular around the state, and that many of the participants here today work with as well. Uh, we have uh, small classroom sizes that are mandated by state law. We have an average of 10 students in our classrooms. Uh, we have one teacher, uh, unless there uh, is a teacher's aide in the cl same classroom, uh, we can move up to 15 students in a classroom, but we have a significantly smaller uh, student population in our classes than in a traditional school setting. Uh, I think that makes our situation a little bit unique. And as I noted earlier, many of our schools have already resumed course classes. Uh, many of them started on July 6th. Uh, others are starting uh, virtually while some are starting in person and have, have been having in-person instruction over the last several weeks. Um, but I continue to hear, uh, and I think I empathize with teachers and support staff and others who have concerns about uh, their safety going back into a classroom setting. Um, considering our situation with our smaller classrooms and those kind of things, what, what can you tell us about uh, teacher and staff safety and student safety in environments that sound similar to ours? Well, and that's why we came up with the, the Healthy at School document to try to, to uh, I don't want to say reassure, but to say these are the these are the things that you need to do to mitigate your risk. Going to a big box store, going to the grocery store, everything we do has a risk. Uh, picking up carry out, and I, I was the queen of carry out uh, before COVID-19. People say, oh, I like to do carry out to support my local community. Man, I've been supporting my local community for decades because I don't cook, but but even having that interaction with someone when they put something in your car, everything we do has a risk. So what are the things we can do to mitigate that risk as much as possible? I'll tell you one of the things that we've had real issues with is we've had, as you know, several outbreaks in, in, um, in conjugate uh, settings, uh, whether it's a behavioral health hospital or long-term care facilities, and we've worked with staff and they, they know everything to do and then as, as staff were, our staff were leaving to get in their car, everybody that worked in that nursing home was standing out in the smoking area having a smoke together or getting in their car going out to lunch together. So they knew what to do in the patient room. They knew how to put their PPE on and how to take it off and they knew all the things they were supposed to do. But the minute they walked out of that healthcare setting, they were just Joe and Jane and Mary Lou, and they were best buds, and they were hanging out together with no mask and no social distancing. And so that's how things happen with staff. So as a, as a faculty member or as a staff member, I think remembering that this is the, all of these safety uh, expectations are not just for your classroom. Uh, therefore, when you're outside of the classroom, in the teacher's lounge, if they even still have teacher's lounges, I don't know, maybe that's old school. Um, I'm old, so that's what I remember, but, but the interactions you have with each other are, are, are very critical. Uh, and so trying to keep that front of mind, and, and that's just hard. I know that's hard, uh, but that's how we're going to keep spread staff, faculty, and students. Right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have a question over in the chats about sick days and uh, before and teachers if they're required to quarantine how that works and so I'll share just a little bit about about that if I could before uh, before you do uh, but sick days have been a big question that have been discussed at length uh, with your superintendents with the school boards uh, with education leaders across the state we've been talking about that issue for several months now uh, in our task force meetings and in the superintendent updates uh, we feel pretty confident that the sick day issue is going to be handled effectively. Uh, one, we have federal law, the federal uh, law that was passed, the relief, the COVID relief law that was passed in the, in the spring at, at the federal level has an extension that goes through 2020 till December 30th at, at least in 2020 uh, that extends the opportunity for sick days. We also have in reg in Kentucky uh, 
the authority for local school boards to grant additional sick days uh, without impact on uh, teachers. So those kinds of things are in place already. So I know that there's some concern of if we are quarantined, do we have to use our sick days? Those things are being addressed both at the federal level and at the state level. But what I would challenge us to think about is a little bit differently about those sick days than maybe, maybe we're thinking about it now. I think that many of us think if we have a student in our classroom that tests positive for COVID-19 and we are all required to quarantine that then we automatically do not have school for the next 14 days and that we're out. Um, I think what we have to do is think differently about what this would look like. And we can very quickly, as you all have done in the past, as you did in the spring, we should very quickly transition those classes to a distance learning instructional model so that we're not missing instructional time. We don't have to cancel school for those 14 days. We can transition into a different format for delivery. And I think that's what we have to be creative about thinking here. Um, our students, as you all know, we, they live together in a DJJ facility or they live together uh, in a residential group home setting. Uh, some of them are in day treatment programs, but we have been effectively able to transition how we deliver instruction. And that's what I would challenge us to do. If we, if we find ourselves in a situation where we have to move from in-person instruction because we're quarantined, we should start looking for other alternatives of how we can continue the education and the learning of our students without interruption. Uh, and so that's what I would challenge us to do. The sick day issue is gonna be handled if that's required, but I want us to move away from that into thinking about how do we deliver instruction continually through that quarantine process? Because not all of those kids are gonna be uh, sick. They're not all gonna be symptomatic. You may not be sick or symptomatic. Uh, and so we can move into a different model of delivery and that's what I would challenge us to do. Dr. White, do you have additional thoughts on that? I certainly can't top that, no. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. Um, some of the questions that you might have, and I'm sure in the Department of Public Health, you're working with uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice and Community-Based Services about residential facilities where students live. Uh, has there been additional guidance developed around those facilities for those folks uh, and are those similar to the school guidance documents? They're, they're very similar to the school guidance and, and we have a uh, healthcare acquired infection uh, committee, not committee, program here in, in the Department of Public Health. So whenever there's an outbreak uh, in any kind of, of group setting, group home, we've worked with several with the Department uh, for uh, uh, Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities, uh, and we've worked with BCBS. Uh, community-based services. So whenever there is an outbreak in a, in a setting like that, usually we're called in and, and are available to staff to understand uh, how they can either group. I know I just, was just on the phone this morning. This was a uh, substance use disorder residential area. So they had um, 22 people that were positive. They put them all together in one setting. They took, they tested everybody in the facility, which is not what I I'm recommending you do with school, but but as soon as they found out someone was was positive, they separated everybody that was positive, and those people are going to be in that setting for the next 14 days, and they'll know how to handle the situation. But our our team is very willing and able and ready to help in any kind of uh, of a setting like that when you've got a residential area. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, additional question over in the comments, and again, I thank you so much for your patience because we're giving you a lot of questions. I know you're used to this because I've been in task force meetings with you over the last several months. So I know that you're used to the rapid fire uh, and you handle it uh, with a lot of grace. Um, I feel better knowing that you're there really, <laughs> as you run the calls, Ronnie. Oh yeah, I'm hanging out in there too. Uh, I get to do the superintendent calls with you too. So those are fun sometimes. Um, how long after a person tests positive and becomes ill will they continue to test positive? Um, and if is there an opportunity for retesting at that? There's been some kind of mixed messages about that. Yes, uh, when, when again, when things started, uh, there were two different ways that you could determine when somebody could come out of isolation. <clears throat> One of them was a testing method, and they were saying that you had to be tested white twice and have two negative tests 24 hours apart. Um, we didn't have tests to do that back then. And I fear if you look at those graphs that I showed you, we're going to run out of tests again. Uh, we here in the state of Kentucky recommended people not use the testing strategy, but to use the non-testing strategy. 
And what that non-testing strategy says that once you are positive, when you go for 10 days with no symptoms and three days, and that includes three days of no fever without any uh, non-fever producing medicine like Tylenol or aspirin or, or Advil, 10 days of no symptoms, three days of afebrile, then you can be released from isolation. So that would be, that. that's a recommendation we use with healthcare providers, and that's a recommendation that, that the CDC actually Friday reinforced uh, that to happen. So, so I would go with that non-testing strategy um, it, because some people can have lingering viral particles up in their nose. We had one, I don't know, how he did this, but there was an ER doctor in Western Kentucky that 46 days after his onset, he kept having that PCR test done and he kept turning up positive. Well, he was not infectious. And so the CDC has actually tried to get people like this, this man. They've taken those swabs and tried to, drop, tried to grow the virus in the laboratory and they haven't been able to. So I think if you go with that non-testing method, that's gonna keep that person from being infectious to those around them, uh, and, and you don't have to deal with the continual retesting. Great, thank you so much for that. I think that got us through our major okay. questions over there, just in time. Uh, yes. Dr. White, we appreciate you being here. Do you have any parting thoughts uh, for educators who are going back to the classroom who are already back there now before we, before we sign out? Well, just go with courage and go with grace uh, as, as, as frustrated and cranky as we all get uh, when our when our co-workers and, and our students are that way we have to just take a deep breath and, and go with grace and say it's been a bad day today hasn't it we'll do better tomorrow I, I think that's what we all need to remind ourselves and uh, and this is not going to be forever it's going to be longer than we want it's not going to be forever and when we get to the other side of it we'll have learned a lot about each other and about ourselves so thank you for what you're doing. You do the Lord's work. I'm, I'm so pleased to be a part of this organization. Helping those young, those young folks is, is such a great, a great gift that you have and, and the rest of the state appreciates it. We thank you so much for all of your work and for in the middle of all of this crisis and all of the things that are going on. Uh, we appreciate you taking time being with us here today, spending an hour with us in the middle of, of this pandemic. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for all you're doing. Uh, Glad to do thank it. You for being here. We are going to start back in about 10 minutes uh, with some guided, guided stretching, uh, some yoga before our final session starts. So we hope you'll join us back. Uh, please go to your program, click on that link, join us, and we will see you at the next closing session. Thank you, Dr. White. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.